Amen. So we, uh, we prayed. We asked the Lord, you know, it's a political problem, and i got to be very careful because I, if I made a big deal of it in Canada, then my workers would be in jeopardy. And so we have the opportunity to go preach in the gospel in Pakistan, so then we have to weigh that off of, you know, whether or not we should, you know, jeopardize our workers and close the doors for us to preach the gospel and make an issue of it, or whether we should just uh, believe that somehow we'd be able to work quietly through that and not embarrass the government and work quietly through that at the same time. And so the Lord spoke to me and said, you got to send your workers in once a week. And so I did. I sent them. After two weeks, they called back and they said, uh, evangelists, we can't just go in once a week. we got to go in twice a week. And so I said, that's great. More power to you. And then as, the, as time went on, the Lord began to speak to me to build a church right outside of the brick factory and, uh, and, and a church for them to worship a place where they can grow and learn the things of God, but also a building could be used for a school. Those kids, that lady, she'd never gone to school. Her mom and dad never went to school. Her kids, to this day, have never gone to school. And so that same building that's used for a church on Fridays, because that's the worship day there, uh, the church is used on Friday. During the rest of the week, will be used as a school. And the parents have agreed. They work 12 hours a day. Can you believe this? They've agreed to work two more extra hours so their kids can spend two hours in um, school. And so this is what we're doing. We already have the land and the brick maker, the brick owner. I mean, he, it's kind of a weird relationship. He kind of likes us, but, you know, it doesn't want us to expose him kind of thing. But he gave us, uh, he, he said he'd give us the bricks. So we just have to raise the money for the uh, wiring and roofing and all that kind of stuff. And I know that it's going to come. We're believing to build that by, uh, by the beginning, hopefully by the end of March next year as, as the Lord opens the door. And so um, among other things that we're doing, please pray for that. And I believe that the doors are wide open. Pakistan, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan needs to be saved. Amen. And I'm not afraid to go in there. And I believe that, you know, somebody said, are you afraid? No, I'm not afraid. I, I, I believe the Lord's with me, and he'll protect me. And uh, if he doesn't, then I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. You know, I mean, but I believe he will. Amen. It's like you know, Daniel and I, I believe my God will save me. But, you know, but if he doesn't, I'm still gonna, not going to bow, you know. So I believe this is the work, work of God. We're also in other countries, Islamic countries, where their name's right in the name. The Islamic country of the Islamic Republic of Djibouti. We're in, you know, going to Saudi Arabia next year. We're supposed to go this year, but it was, it's past. So please pray for us. Thank you for your support. We're humbled by uh, the support of the saints, and we're humbled to have connections with such a great ministry like this. And uh, we just thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you. Give yourself a hand for all your giving over the years. I think it's been... It's been almost 30 years of giving and, uh, and helping us, and we are extremely grateful. We don't take for granted, you know, uh, years ago, my son's 21 now, but years ago, uh, he, he went to get the mail, and he started to open the mail, and he found $5 in, in the uh, offering, and he started to laugh. And I got upset with him. I said, don't you ever take $5 for granted? I mean, he was laughing because somebody sent money in the mail still. But I said, don't you ever laugh because every dollar that's given to our ministry represents sacrifice, represents love, represents faith. So whether it's, you know, 50 cents or whether, whatever. And I'm, so I just said that to say thank you for your giving. When you tithe to this church, when you're faithful to the house of God, you're not only, you know, in your offering a confession there, you, only, you not only bless Faith City Church, but you bless those that are in relationship with Faith City Church. Amen? You bless uh, Rhema Bible College. You bless our ministry. You bless other ministries. Amen. So praise God. Let's turn in the Bibles today, to your Bible today, to Genesis chapter 4, verse 25. Genesis 4, verse 25. We'll get into the Word of God. I've got a message today, and it's titled, Try Again. Turn to somebody and say, Try Again. If you first, you don't succeed, try again. Try, try again. In the book of uh, Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, we see uh, it's the beginning of the Bible, it's the beginning of the days, and we see Adam and Eve. And it says here in verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and she named him Seth, for God has appointed another seed 
for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. I want you to see this in some translations. Let me read some other translations. One translation says, and Abraham knew his wife again. Everybody say again. Yeah. One says, and Abraham slept, or Adam slept with his wife again. Somebody say again. Yeah. One says, and Adam and Eve tried again, and they had a son. Another translation says, and Adam and Eve, or Adam had sexual relationships with his wife again. Now, all the men have, they, you got all the men's attention right now. This is not... This is not a marriage seminar. It's not a seminar on uh, relationships. But it is a, 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 a message on faith that we need to keep going. We need to keep putting our faith forward. And there is an effort to faith. Where grace is free, all we have to do is receive. Uh, there is an effort to faith. There is a, a reward of faith. Grace is given freely, but faith is rewarded. And so the Bible says that Adam... Tried again. He tried again. Would you just look up at me right now? Let's just pray. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that every time your word goes forward, that there is a possibility, if the ears are open of the believer, there's a possibility for life-changing uh, 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 power to come into their life. Lord, I believe today that it could be a life-altering uh, message for those that are listening today, not only in this uh, sanctuary, but those that are in uh, their homes and wherever they are today as they watch via TV and by the internet. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would touch somebody tonight, today. I pray you'd shake up somebody today. I pray you'd set somebody free today. I pray you'd heal somebody today. And I pray you'd save somebody today. And everybody said amen. amen. And so uh, the message is try again. God creates Adam and uh, in, the, in the story. Now we, uh, and God gives to Adam a, a helpmate, a wife, a partner in crime. Uh, uh, he gives her a chick, on the, him the chick, a chick on the side. The Old Testament calls her a, a helpmate, a best friend. And uh, we don't know how long uh, Adam and Eve were on the earth before the fall. Um, you know, some people calculate 8,000 years. And if you're a literal, literalist, or some people think that the world's been around for millions of years. I have no problem with either side. I, I, I really won't get caught in an argument on that. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, comma. And then it says, and the earth was without form and void. Well, what did you ever know that God made that wasn't good or was without void? So um, somewhere in there, and we don't know how long Adam and Eve were on the earth. They were given a, a job. They were given a ministry. And their ministry is to be fruitful and multiply and to subdue the earth. Amen. And, uh, but somewhere along the line, whenever it was, how long into their life it was, I don't know. But we know that Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and they sinned. And you know that Adam and Eve went and hid themselves. And God, being God, being loving, being merciful, went and found them and, and, and covered them. Isn't that right? I wanted to show you something now. This is religion in a nutshell. That when people do wrong, they go and hide. When people do wrong, they go and cover themselves. Can I tell you something? By personal experience, uh, the best thing to do is when you make a mistake is not to hide. It's not to try and cover. But the Bible says that he that uh, covers his sins will not prosper. Uh, but he that confesses and repents shall prosper. And that doesn't mean you have to stand up and blab it to everybody. You know, a lot of things don't need to be told to everybody. But there has to, you have to find somebody, a buddy, a pastor, uh, a, a fellow worker, uh, uh, somebody you respect, and get healing, not just forgiveness from God, but get healing in your life. Come on now. You don't want to go and hide. You don't want to go and cover yourself up. But the best thing, the fastest way to get healed, you might get away with things for a whole lifetime, but all your life, you'll still be remembering, you'll still be living under that cloud. He that confesses his sins shall prosper. Somebody say amen. amen. And so uh, Adam and Eve, they, they uh, covered themselves. They were naked. And God comes up to them and said, who, who said you were naked? Why do you have clothes on? And, uh, you know, why do you have fig leaves on? Why have you covered yourself? And, and they said, because we're naked. God said, who told you you were naked? And God in his mercy 
slew an animal. We don't know what kind of animal it was, but God slew an animal and he took the skin. There was the shedding of blood. You know the story. And the shedding of blood and God covered uh, Adam and Eve with the skin of that animal. And that is symbolic of the covering and cleansing that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so then we see Adam and Eve, uh, uh, they, start, uh, they start rising up. And they begin to walk in the call of God again. And as they were told to go f- be fruitful and multiply, they started uh, being restored. They were cl- cleansed. They were forgiven. And they, start, they started walking in their gifts and callings. And they started fulfilling the command of God, be fruitful and multiply. And then uh, Eve brought forth two sons. Cain and Abel. And uh, things are going well. They're being blessed by the Lord. And, and uh, they love their sons. And things are going well. And, 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 and they feel like they're on top of the world. And then all of a sudden, uh, a tragedy strikes. Um, they, uh, s- something happens. Uh, a development occurs. Uh, unexpected, the unexpected arrives. I think I'm Talking about, you know, it sounds like 2020. The unexpected arrived. Something negative occurred. Uh, 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 a, a cog in the wheel ha- happened and the toilet paper ran out. Come on now. Can't find milk and eggs. Jobs are closing down. The unexpected happened. And uh, they're obeying God. They're walking with God. And now all of a sudden, right out of the middle of nowhere, something happens. And you give your head a shake and you say, you know, what's going on? And we know the story. What happened was that Cain killed Abel. They're walking in the call of God, the blessings of God. They're fulfilling the call of God. They're being fruitful and multiplying. And out in left field, all of a sudden, Cain rises up in anger, slays Abel, and now Adam and Eve are stunned. It's like, it's like the breath was taken away from them. It's like they lost their wind to go forward. They, they lost their desire to, to succeed. Not only did they lose Abel to death, but they, left, they, left, they lost Cain as he, as he had to be expelled, and he, and he traveled very far, and so they lost both sons. And I don't know whether you know this, but the, the, the name Abel means breath. It means wind. It means, uh, it means to blow. And I don't know whether you've ever been through situations like that, but I sure have. That there's times when situations, unexpected situations come into your life where the wind gets knocked out of you. I've heard many people say this, that they felt like the wind got knocked out of them in, on March 15th. And they feel like there's been no wind in their sail for the last six months. Are you with me right now? And, and, and so there's not probably not a person in here that hasn't thought they were here, but all of a sudden found themselves over there because of some expected thing that happened, and it took the breath from you. And instead of having the energy and the veracity and the, uh, the, 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 the power to go forward, now you're just sitting there shaking your head and stunned and not, not really know what's happening. And I think that I'm talking to somebody right here in this room. Even the pandemic itself is symbolic of the breath being taken away from you. You know, when you have the, you, it's hard to breathe and, and, and you, you, your nose gets plugged up and there's all kinds of symptoms that take away the breath from you. Uh, every, you know, uh, the great philo- uh, philosopher and theologian uh, uh, and thinker of the day, Iron Mike Tyson, he said, everybody has a game plan until you get punched in the face. Maybe that's how you feel today. Honestly, I've had days like that. I've had times when I didn't know it was coming. I had times when it just seems like I was going up and all of a sudden I found myself flat on my back. Um, in moments like these, even in the pandemic, you know, the shutdown, financial fears, health concerns, questions, conflicting reports, <laughs> conflicting reports, hey? Uh, conspiracy theories. Bill Gates is going to get you. Dr. Fushi's out to put an uh, implant in your hand. Or your, um, kids going back to school or not going back to school. Do I have to teach them at home? Uh, should I 
try to look for a private school, how would I pay for that? All these things take the breath out of us because now your breath is being used for things that you never thought you'd have to deal with and you don't have the energy to deal with the things you want to deal with. Are you with me right now? And I don't know who it is, but I think I'm talking to some people uh, here in this building, but also those of you who are watching at home, don't turn the dial. You just sit there, stop talking with everybody else, listen to this word because it will help you. It will bless you, and I believe it will help you to get your life back. I'm starting a series on the road. I've got a four-part series on getting your life back. This is part of it. God wants you to get your life back. How many know he wants you to get your life back? And I've heard numerous people, they said it just felt like Groundhog Day for six months. But let me tell you, life doesn't have to be like Groundhog Day. You can get up and you can get your life back. God knows how to restore and bless and build up and, and encourage. Amen. But I'm reminded of Ezekiel 37 uh, where God speaks to the prophet and he says, Go and prophesy to the bones and prophesy to the wind that breath will come back into the bones. I believe today in a small way or in a big way that I'm here uh, as a messenger of God to breathe the breath of God into areas that are shallow, that are, that are not working properly, to breathe the breath of God into areas of your life that have become dry, that have become empty, to breathe the breath of God into your ministry, to breathe the breath of God into your Christian walk, and to say that it's time to wake up and breathe and take a hold of the Spirit of God and to go forward, and if you will, to try again. Amen. And so... Uh, referring to Ezekiel, God prophesies, and we're going to come back to that, but God says, prophesy to the bones. Gather up those bones. Prophesy to the bones. Uh, uh, gather those bones and, 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 and believe that they'll come, prophesy that they'll come back together, and then, and then breathe on those bones that the life of God would come into them. And today, I believe, those of you out there are, uh, that are listening by way of television or by way of computer, that it's time for you also to have the breath of God back into you and that the bones of this, the church of a Thunder Bay would come back together, hallelujah, and the breath of God would breathe into us not just how it was, but into a new dimension and sphere of life and vitality. Somebody say amen. I've got three points, and then we're going to go back to Ezekiel. Firstly, I believe it's time to believe again. I believe it's a time to believe again. Many of our hearts have been dashed and many of our, our, our desires to move forward have been crushed. And it seems like we've been in a holding pattern for many, many months. Uh, I, I don't know about you. I can say I've been, I've been scarred, but I'm not scared. Uh, I, I'm not going to let COVID define me. Come on now. I'm not going to let some uh, marriage problem define me. Come on, not that I have a marriage problem, but I'm just saying that you, you're not going to let a marriage problem define you. You're not going to let some sickness define you. You're not going to camp here in 2020 and say that's all there is to life. But, yeah, you might have been scarred, but you're not scared. You're going to move forward. You're going to believe again. I remember when I had the flesh-eating virus, and I only bring this up to, to say one thing that when I came out of the flesh-eating virus and 11 other people died and I was the only one who survived as a preacher, uh, I remember uh, the, the, they, uh, they tried to get me to make God look small and, and uh, sickness look big. And I remember, and so the news, I, I said, no, it's not God who did this. God's the one who brought me through, if you don't know that. And, uh, you know, they tried, the newspapers and TV tried to make, they interviewed me. They wanted to make God look small and uh, the sickness look big. And why did God do this? And I said, well, I don't believe God did it. I call upon the name of the Lord. And he heard me, hallelujah. My heart would have failed for fear, but, he, but, I, but, he, but I remembered the, God, the Lord my God in the land of the living, hallelujah. But then after that, after being on the news, uh, on the television, both in March, uh, May rather, and also at Christmas time, at New Year's, you know, the highlights uh, of New Year's, it was in Florida and all over, you know, that this big flesh-eating virus broke out, and my face, my mug was on TV again, and, and uh, then Hunter Huntley called me, and I know Reynolds and Ronnie and Ellen and Elaine, and uh, David and Jean, uh, Jean uh, Wins, uh, 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 Wins, uh, Mains, I, I grew up with Reynolds and Ronnie. Reynolds is a co-laborer with me in, in Uganda right now. 
And, but they called me up and asked me to go on and give my testimony. And I prayed about it, and I just felt for me, not for anybody else, for me, yes, I wanted to give God the glory for bringing me through, but I didn't want to be labeled the guy who lost his finger. Because I've got more in my life to do than just be the, and I want to be known for more than just the guy who lost his finger, the guy who came through by the skin of his teeth. Are you with me right now? I remember when Mikel Mantela, some of you know him, I'll be up with him in, in Flin Flon, by the way he says hello to, to you and, and to the church. But when, Mike, when Mikel Mantela, uh, uh, and I don't know whether Hunter Huntley understood that, but I just didn't want to be labeled and known that way. I want to be known for the things that I'm doing for God and for being an integrous man. And so that was just a, a glitch in my life. I'm not going to camp there. That's not who I am. I'm not the man with the cripple little wimpy hand I'm, uh, I'm a mighty man of God and that happened is just a little scar in my life it's not a big deal and when Mikael Mantela went through a broken neck he was on uh, Kenneth Copeland Ministries and he got a lot of invitations to speak around and at one point he, I said that's wonderful but I just want you to know Mikael that's not who you are you are more than just the man who broke his neck you're more than just a man who got healed. Yes, make that your testimony. Talk about it often, but make sure people know that you're bigger than that. Come on now. We are bigger than COVID. We are bigger than the things that have set us back. We are bigger than the problems that we've come through. And God says it's time to believe again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you still with me right now? Believing is what I allow into my heart. You know, can I say this? There's a lot of things you can't control, right? I can't control the price of fuel, and I can't control, you know, uh, uh, I can't control, you know, what's going on in the world. I can't control what uh, our prime minister does. I can't control, you know, a lot of things. But there's two things you control. You can control your believing and your speaking. And they are the two things that you have been, it's your God-given right to control. And they're also the things that a lot of times Christians don't control. But your believing and speaking are the two things that you can control. Believing is what I allow into my heart. Believing is what I allow to walk, to take into my spirit. Believing is what I allow to get it. Listen, you know, you spend your whole day scrolling, 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 finding out what bad news there is and all the stuff's going on. Listen, there has to be a time when you turn off your phone and you hear the word of God and you meditate upon the word of God and you say, yes, but I'm bigger than that. My God's bigger than that. He's got a future. He's got a destiny for me. And I'm not going to let COVID or anything else label me. Yeah. Hallelujah. So believing is what you... Uh, believing is what you, uh, you put into your heart, and speaking is what you uh, let out of your heart. Isn't that right? Um, and so, uh, you know, in the book of Psalm, it says that God is writing, there's two places in the book of Psalm, it says that God's writing a book about you. And uh, in an open vision just a couple of nights ago, when I was thinking about that, and I'm not, uh, you know, trying to make myself sound super spiritual, but I saw in the spirit a, a great room with books. And I saw some were open. I saw angels scribing. And I saw a whole area, a whole warehouse almost, if you will speak. And of course, God speaks to us in ways that we understand. But I saw in the spirit a whole section, a whole warehouse of books with dust on them of people that were still alive that stopped really believing, that stopped really trusting, that stopped really wanting to advance, that just said, I'm just going to put in time until the roll is called up yonder. I'm just going to put it in time until I die, slap it, be for boogie, and go to be with heaven, with Jesus in heaven. But God has a book for you. And there are pages and pages of some of those books that aren't written because in the midst of opposition, in the midst of trial, we stop believing. God says, try again. God says it's time to believe again. It's time to open up your heart and trust him and allow the goodness of God to get in our heart. Now, the balance of this is this. I need to be informed. I need to know what's going on in the world. I need to know, uh, uh, I need to be aware, but I don't need to be obsessed. I need to be familiar, but I don't need to be frightened. 
I need to know what the world is saying, but I need to remind myself that I am not of this world. Come on now. I am not to be conformed to this world. I, I, I can choose what I believe. I can choose to believe the word rather than the world. I, cannot, I choose either to let the world crush me into his mold and make my life smaller and smaller and smaller, or I choose to believe God's word and let him enlarge me and fulfill my destiny and my purpose. And God says, it's time to believe again. I can't afford to get the to allow the world into my heart. The Bible says, in, in Proverbs it says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of them flow the boundaries or the issues of your life. In other words, the more words you get into your heart, the more your boundaries increase. The less words you get in your heart, the more your life shrinks up. The Bible says a generous man, his life will get larger and larger and larger. And a, and a, and a, a stingy man, his life will get smaller and smaller. And so we see that your heart and what you allow into your heart will determine how big you are and how fast you go and how far you go. Somebody say amen. And it says, guard your heart. And then it says, put away a froward, not forward, F-R-O-W-A-R-D. I looked up the word froward, uh, a froward and perverse lips. Put away a froward and perverse, perverse lips. I looked up that word froward. And what it means is a, a mouth that is not under the counsel, that is not under the conviction, that is not under the constraint, that is not under the compulsion of God's word. Guard your heart, watch what you put into your heart, and watch what you put out of your mouth. Make sure that what you allow out of your mouth is under the counsel, the conviction, the constraint, and the compulsion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Speaking out of your heart, speaking is what comes out of your heart. The Bible says a man, a good man out of the treasure of his heart brings good things, but an evil man brings forth evil things. I refuse to let this pandem uh, pandemic poison my potential. I refuse to let distraction distance me from my destiny. I refuse to let friction fracture my future. Come on now. I'm aware that the switch of the situations and circumstances around me, my ship, but I'm convinced that my mouth is like a rudder that will ultimately turn my ship in the right direction. It's time to believe again, amen. The second point, it's time to dream again. The Bible says, so Adam and Eve, uh, we're going through a season of grieving. You know, when Adam, uh, Abel died and Cain uh, was put out and had to leave, there had to be a series of grieving. Now, I don't know where you are on the grieving issue, but I, the Bible says we grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. So grieving is okay, and, and I, you know, I don't want to split hairs over it, but when you're grieving, don't Grieve without hope because then you'll go into a dark place. When you're grieving, you need to be around people that can remind you of your future, your destiny, your purpose. And even though somebody's gone and, and left you and even though it feels like part of you has died with them, you're still going to go on. You're going to find your purpose. You're going to find your destiny. And you're, you know that because you know Jesus that you're going to see these people face to face. So we don't grieve as those who have no hope. I did a funeral probably one of my first funerals with a family who lost their son in a drunken car accident. And I'll never forget, they weren't saved. They, were part, they came in and out of the church and we asked to do it. And I went down to the funeral home and just the wailing and screaming and the wailing and screaming from families, I'd never seen that in my life because all the other funerals I've been to were funerals of people who had the hope of life everlasting. How dark it is to lose somebody and not know that there is a heaven beyond this. How dark it is to think that things are just over and there's nothing left. So it's okay to grieve, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. And yeah, take time to grieve, but don't make that your lifestyle. Take time to grieve, but don't uh, make that who you are. You're not just the one who lost somebody. You're not just the one who... Uh, you, you know, was set back. You're not the, just the one who got released from your job. You're not just the one who went through that problem. You're not just the one who lost your daughter. You're not just the one who went through that marriage problem. You're not the one who just went through a horrible six months. No, my friend, grieve for a moment. But then after you're grieving, start dreaming again. Hallelujah. 
I'm reminded of Joseph. His brothers came down to Egypt and they saw him. And the first time, it says the brothers didn't know who he was. But the second time they came, they bowed before him. And the Bible says, and Joseph remembered his dream. 19, and I've shared this story before, but I just feel that to, to, by, impressed by the Holy Spirit to share it again. In 1999, a man named John Olstein died. He died January 23rd, 1999. January 23rd is my birthday. And when he died, uh, I, I, he had an impact on my life. I've never, I never met the man, never once. But he had an impact on my life because the first time I ever heard anything from him was, it was a series called Confessions of a Baptist Preacher. It was a 12-part series. It was 30 minutes uh, uh, each series. And on a Saturday night, I usually went to bed at 9 o'clock on a Saturday night because I'd get up about 5 the next morning and pray, and I had a couple services during the day, and, and so I wanted to be refreshed. But I put on a John Olstein uh, tape on Confessions of a Baptist Preacher, and he's preaching on the infilling of the Holy Ghost in such a way uh, a fresh way that I hadn't heard being growing up in Pentecost. And as he was preaching, I watched the first one, the second one, the third one. And before I went to bed, I watched six hours, three o'clock in the morning. I went to bed refreshed after hearing the word of God. But one thing he did in each service, he would take his hands and he would put his hands up like this. And he'd say, at the end of a service, he said, I've showed you the way of life everlasting. I've showed you that if you receive Jesus, you have life. And if you don't receive Jesus, you don't have life. Do you see any blood on my hands? No, there's no blood on my hands because I've done my job as a preacher, a man of God, to tell you there is a heaven and a hell. There is a, a devil and there is a, a savior. And if you receive Jesus, you can have life. But if you don't receive Jesus, the wrath of God will abide on you. And I remember putting my hand on that little 14-inch portable television. I was on a crate because that's all we owned. And I put, I was on there and I put my hand on it and I said, God, I don't care whether I ever could preach like him, but I want to be able to win souls because hundreds would come down to the altar. And I, I did that with Reinhard Bonke. I did it with all the guys who were reaching the lost. I, I had such a, a desire to see souls come into the kingdom of God. When he died, just a couple of weeks before he died, he, he got up and preached and, and he, he stood by the pulpit and I'd heard this many times through his ministry, because I watched his life. You know, John Olstein is the father of Joel Olstein. There's a Joel Olstein because there was a John Olstein. And he would, on the last day, a couple days before he died, the last message, he put his hand on the pulpit and he said, great it is to dream the dream when you stand in your youth at the starry stream, but a greater thing. Oh, a greater thing. Hallelujah. And I've been there, I've been there. But a greater thing is to fight life through and to say at the end, the dream is two cheers streaming down his face. He said, I want to tell you, the dream has been true. And I remember that day, as, and they showed that. He had, they showed different clips of him saying that all the way through his life. And at the end, the last thing he said before he left the pulpit was, the dream is true. Well, I remember that day, January 23rd. That's my birthday. Don't forget, send me a card. <laughs> and, uh, but that day, January 23rd, 1999, I began to weep, and I didn't weep because he passed on. I never met the man, but he had an impact on my life. But I began to weep, and God was dealing with me that now was the time to go into missionary evangelism, go into the northern Africa and to the Muslim countries of the world. And that day, the Lord gave me a, 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 a part of that, that, that uh, poem. And in my heart, I heard these words, the dream is true. The dream is true. And so I said, I will follow you. I will not sleep and dream on the dream, but I will arise and fulfill the Spirit's dream and fulfill each task that he's called me to. Well, he whispers in my ear, the dream is true. Over the month of August this year, uh, I felt uh, anxious and wanted to get up and running, and I just felt that it was time to stir myself up and refresh my heart. And it's like God burst back into my heart as I started believing again and started feeling like it's time to go forward. I felt the dream rise back up in my heart and realizing that we've only reached 2.9 million people for Jesus and I got in my heart 10 million. I've got to get going. I said, God, would you make that dream stronger than it's ever been? That would you just breathe the breath into me again? Give me the energy, the strength, the fortitude, the, the guts, the, the, the resources to do what you've called me to do. I believe the dream is true. And so I believe for you as well 
that God has put dreams in your heart. The Bible says, in the last days. How many know we're in the last days? God says, I will pour my spirit out upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Are they prophesying yet? An old man will dream dreams. Hallelujah. And young men shall see visions. And I'll pour my spirit upon the handmaidens. I believe this is a time. If ever there was a time in history. Right now is a time to believe again. Right now is a time to dream again. And I'm here to stir up some of those things that God spoke to you years ago that have not yet come to pass. Take that book that's in heaven. Tell God you're going dust, to dust it off because you've got something to do with your life. You've got a place to go. You have a destiny. You have a call of God on your life. You're not just here to suck wind, sip coffee, and pass wind. You're here to do something for Jesus. Let the dream come alive. Believe again. Believe again. Maybe it's a new dream. Maybe it's an old dream. Maybe it's a, a exa an exaggerated dream. Maybe it's a, a fantastical dream. Maybe it's a dream so far beyond what you could think or even imagine. But dream again. Dream again. Young E. Cho says dreams and visions are the language of the spirit. It's the language of the supernatural. Uh, they take you beyond the natural. They take you beyond the now. They take you into your future. Hallelujah. God has a dream for you. You know, uh, I'm reminded of Jeremiah 29. I didn't have that in my notes, but I'm just reminded of Jer Jeremiah 29. Everybody knows Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. But if ever there was time when Jeremiah 29, the whole chapter, how many know there's more verses than just verse 11? But if there's a time when Jeremiah 29 is so is relevant, it's more relevant now than ever. Because all the prophets were saying, close up, shut your doors, hide away, life is over, everything's done as you know it. The world's going sideways. You just, you know, don't buy cars, don't, don't buy a house, don't do anything. Just stop your life, put it on hold, plug your nose, don't breathe, you know. You know, uh, you know it just, just hide away, get some you know, rations and just hide away in your bunker. No, God says in the midst of that, no, you go buy houses, you go buy cars, you go make babies, uh, you go live your life and keep me at the center for I have good plans for you a future and I hope somebody say amen it's time to dream dreams again it's time to take your life off pause get your finger off the pause button believe again dream again if you can believe again if you can dream again then you can expect again and the Bible says that Adam Try it again. I'm here to tell you to try again. Try believing again. Try dreaming again. Because when he tried again, the Bible says that Eve brought forth a son and she called him Seth. And it's not just by accident. The word Seth means consolation. I looked up the word consolation. It means payback. I'm here to tell you that if you'll dream again, if you'll believe again, whatever has been taken from you will be paid back, hallelujah, because when the thief is found, uh, the enemy has to restore sevenfold. It's time to expect again. It's time to believe, try. If you can try again, you can believe again, you can dream again, then you can expect again. I'm believing. I'm believing. The Bible says in Joel chapter 2, that he will restore that which the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust has eaten away. Listen to me right now. I don't know what you've lost during these six months. I don't know what you've lost during these last decades. I don't know. I, I, it's not that I don't care, but I don't know. You don't know, say you'll come up to me and say, yeah, but, but I, you don't know what I go through. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know what you're going through, but in a sense I don't care. But I really do care, but I don't care enough to change God's word for you. Your situation is not so unique that God can't restore you. Your situation is not so unique that God can't lift you up. Your situation is not so different. Your sickness is not so great. Yeah, but pastor, I was written up in the Boston Journal of Medicine. Mine's so special. Well, aren't you special? You got something that Jesus can't cure. Not
Hallelujah. Listen to me. You got to know this. Salvation comes by grace. But advancement comes by faith. And some of you are not advancing because even though, and don't be careful, we can nod and we can say, yes, I'm a man of faith. Yes, this is a church of faith. And you go to a church of faith, but if you don't use your faith, you're deceiving yourself. Your faith will get you up when everybody's down. Your faith will put money in your pocket when other people don't have money. Your faith will get you through when other people die in the storm. Your faith will cause you to, at the end of the year to say, wow, we really did have plenty in 2020. I heard all the people beginning of the year, oh, plenty, heaven plenty in 2020. Well, I want to not only can say I confessed it, I want to say I'm living it, hallelujah. And you can too, listen to me, faith is work. You got to try. We labor to enter in to his rest. Faith is work. Try again, believe again, dream again, expect again. And the Bible says, Jesus said, behold, I come quickly and my reward. He's not talking about grace there. He's talking about the reward of faith. Every time you use your faith, Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. I'm not just talking about the second coming. I'm talking about him coming into your life when he sees your faith. He comes and brings his reward, hallelujah. And he rewards you. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Somebody say amen. amen. Believe again. Dream again. Expect again. I want you to go to, over to Ezekiel 37 just for a moment as we close. Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me. He carried me out in the spirit and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. He caused me to pass by them around them. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, it was very, very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, only thou knowest. Go down to verse 11. And he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. It's the church. Behold, they say our bones are dead, our hope is lost, and we are cut off of our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus the Lord God, Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves, and I will cause you to come up from your graves, and I will bring you into your land, into your inheritance. You say, what? Is this all about? The Lord told me. And I want to say this, that I actually saw a vision of the nation of Canada. And I saw bones lying across it. And I'm not, a, I'm not really going into the visions and stuff like that too much. But I saw bones of the believers scattered all over the place. Some are back in church. Some are not back in church. Some are backsidden. Some are scattered. If you think of all the people over the years that came to this house, this church would be a church of a couple thousand people. And then I know, then I thought about COVID and how people have been lackadaisical in getting back to the house. Now listen, let me qualify that. You might be at, at home right now and, and, and you've got a, 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 a sickness and, and you want to stay away or you're afraid of somebody else catching it. I get that. And you might be at home for a specific, specific reason. But let me say this. I know as a fact, I've talked to many pastors, that there's a lot of Christians out there that are taking advantage of COVID when God says, don't neglect the assumption assembling of the saints back together and how much more as you see the last days approaching so God told me to prophesy to this nation and command the bones to come back together and I want you to stand on your feet with me right now all over this city all over this nation of Canada we want to prophesy to the bones of the believers that they would come back together listen we're not good separated because when we're separated, we do not have a supply. But I felt the Lord say to me as I got on this road this year, God says, tell the church across Canada, it's time to get back in the house of God. It's time to believe again. It's time to dream again. It's time to expect again. It's time to take your finger off the pause button and come back together and supply one another's needs again. So I want you to lift up your hands right now. 
Father, over this nation, would you just pray with me right now? Over this nation right now of Canada, the young, the old, the rich, the poor, from every tongue, every tribe that live in this nation, that once were in the house of God. Some are backslidden. Some have gone so far away, but I call them back in. I call those bones back in. Some are scattered now just because they love God, but they've just been taking advantage, taking an extra long summer. But God, I call those bones back into the house of God. I call those bones to come together in Jesus' name. And I command the toe bone to be connected to the foot bone. And the foot bone be connected to the ankle bone. And the ankle bone, come on church, pray with me. And the ankle bone to be connected to the leg bone. And the leg bone connected to the knee bone. And I command the hip bone to be connected to the spine bone. And the spine bone connected to the neck bone. And the neck bone connected to the head bone who is Jesus Christ. I call those bones back together. Every dry, every dead, every scattered believer across this nation. I call them back into the house of God. And so he said unto them, prophesy. Prophesy unto these bones. He said unto them, oh you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord God, these bones I will cause the breath to enter into you. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring flesh upon you. And I will cover you with skin and breathe upon you in the life of God. You shall know that I am the Lord. So Ezekiel said, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And I prophesied and there was a nose and behold I heard the rattling. I hear in the spirit, come on, do you hear in the spirit, the rattling and the shaking of bones in the city of Thunder Bay. Those that have scattered, those that left with their nose out of joint, those that thought they knew better than the pastor, those that listened to some crazy nut on the TV and don't even know them but made them the authority in their life rather than the word of God. I hear the rattling of bones. I see them coming back together. I see sinews coming together, joints being supplied. I see the flesh coming upon them. I, I see skin covering them in the name of Jesus. But then Ezekiel said, they came back together, but they were just a social club. They came back together, but they were just a gathering. They came back together, but they were just there to eat food, bannikin. They came back together and they were there just to play bingo. God says, he said, but I, I, they all came to back together. They came back together. They came back together. But there was no breath in them. And then God said, and over this church right now, and over the people of this city right now, the believers, those bones that are coming back together, God said, breathe the breath of God. You might have had your breath taken away from you. But right now, in the name of Jesus, I breathe the breath of God back into you. The wind of God. Oh, come ye far winds and breathe upon these people that they might live the life of God, the abundant life, the eternal life, the overcoming life, the victorious life, the life of a priest and a king. In the name of Jesus, breathe upon them now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I want you to lift up your hands and just praise the Lord right now. In the name of Jesus. Give us a song. Give us a song. Give us a song. Let's just worship the Lord for a moment. Just lift up your hands and worship the Lord. Seal this right now. The bones are coming back together. The breath of God's coming back into you. Every dry bone. Every dead area of your life. I speak the breath of God into you. Those of you out in TV land. It's time to come back to the house of God. Promise keeper, light in the darkness. Come on, worship him, worship him, worship him. Look alive.
a wonderful message. Thank you, Lord God, for the revelation of your word. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit this morning. Thank you for the message we receive. We receive it, Lord God. Thank you. We're not going to let hard times define us. We're going to follow your word. We're going to follow what it says. We thank you, Lord God, for all that's been done. We thank you, Lord God. It is fixed in your mind, that book that you said in Psalm 139, that a book has been written about our lives. And everything in it, let it be done. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. What a wonderful word. You know, I've heard so many things over the last little while about how COVID has affected different ones in different ways. And one of the things I heard about a pastor, he said, you know, churches who just had a little didn't have the word, you're going to see we're the real churches so the word of God will really define us. Amen? We receive the word of God. You guys have a wonderful afternoon. God bless you, Mark. We just love you. Come on back again real soon and uh, we love you. So follow this man here. <laughs>